Hello, welcome to this biology web class. Give me a, a thumbs up or something if you can hear me okay and the sounds working just so I just so I know. How is everybody this evening? Anybody have any any exciting news? Oh, thumbs up. Thanks, Snazzy G. Um, yeah, never, never quite sure <laughs> if it's gonna if it's gonna work correctly. Good evening, good evening. Welcome back, returning students. Welcome for the first time. Any any newbies? Um, oh yeah, of course it's half term, isn't it? Um, yeah, so I guess most of you guys are not not in school. Probably pretty nice to have a, a bit of a break. Has anybody got mocks or anything straight after half term that you've got to do some revision for? Or are you like more, more chilled? Bonnie, got some exams. If you worked out a, a revision schedule then, that's like one of the, the most important things you can do. Work out a good schedule that's realistic but achievable and try and stick to it. Um, but don't spend like a pitfall people fall into spending like five hours creating a really beautiful looking color coded timetable, but then they don't actually even do it. So don't waste time doing that. But um, yeah, try and make something that's attainable. So Cal, you've got, you've got no sort of marks. Interesting. Yeah, it's, it's I really, I find it very interesting to hear what the different schools are doing. It's obviously a really tricky situation this year and everyone's been given like different things to do and it was, it's all a bit of a mess. So it's interesting to hear the um, uh, what people have been up to. Okay, I think let's make a start with the lesson today. So we're looking at cell differentiation and specialization. So um, yeah, two long words uh, often thrown about together are uh, really important for biology. So how the cells become specialized and like why do they do it? That's like the main gist. And then we'll look at some examples as well. So before we jump in, just a little bit about me. Uh, my name's Alex. I'm the head of biology here at SnapProvise. Um, I've been teaching and teaching biology for the last four or five years now. Um, was working in schools originally, but now moved into, uh, into like tutoring. Um, yeah, so and then now a bit about SnapProvise. So the reason we're offering these uh, weekly lessons at the moment on YouTube is kind of to advertise and to promote our new GCSE service. So we're launching a GCSE sort of tutoring and revision platform and program. Um, so I just realized the cursor is on the screen. Move it out of the way. It's kind of annoying. Um, and yeah, so it was due to start. I think we've pushed it back slightly. Just want to get a few more things in order to make sure it's looking really good before you guys uh, like like access to it. So it's, it's gone back a little bit. And I think the competition has also been extended. If anybody was asking about that, that was some comments. Um, but yeah, so we do web classes. So they're interactive classes, kind of like this, but with a much smaller uh, class size. So usually somewhere around like eight to 10 students in one lesson. So it's, I'd say, slightly more interactive than on YouTube when we do it. And we definitely get through like slightly more content in the, in the smaller class size. So this is a taster. It's not exactly what it's like in the, in the actual, uh, on, the, on our website, basically. And there's also some extra things like uh, high quality handouts. So basically cheat sheets with condensed summarized information and all the past recordings will be saved. So if you miss one, doesn't matter. And if you want to, if you want some one to one support, so you can like basically ask direct questions to a, to a tutor, that's also possible on the website. So outside of the web classes, you can like ask specific things. Um, Callie, how much longer are these going on for? I think we've got one this week. And then we've got one more next week. And I think that's going to be the last one. So next week is the last week. And then we should be starting. The price, I actually still haven't heard exactly what we're doing price wise. Um, but yeah, 
if you email in, you can get all the information um, and find out find out there. So, yeah, as most of you are aware, or the returning students for sure, uh, we're running this competition. We're giving away ten free accounts. So all you have to do to sign up or to be in a chance with winning is uh, go to this website uh, and just enter your email. As simple as that. So that it now ends on the 25th of February. So 10 more days to, to enter. There's the link in the, in the comments. All your questions. Uh, Kumar, yes, I could answer all your questions. Unfortunately, I haven't got time now to go through that also because it's, it's not a topic we're doing. That's, um, that's like A2 stuff rather than uh, this is a GCSE class about cells. So um, unfortunately, we can't talk about NAD and FAD in this class. But if you are a subscriber, then you can ask whatever questions you wanted uh, and you get, a, you get an answer from the tutor. Um, yeah, unfortunately they are. We, I think we might do like monthly classes on YouTube in the, in the future rather than uh, like weekly ones. But we're hopefully um, getting you guys to, to sign up, to subscribe. That's the, that's the aim. So, um, yeah, our objectives today, um, we're going to explain the importance of differentiation. We're going to look at a range of specialized animal and plant cells. And then if we have time, we might not, um, we'll look at slightly uh, how the structure affects the, the function. So we're going to look at some case studies, some examples, basically, of some of the more, more famous cells. So these are the spec points. Just going to flick over them quite quickly today because I want to just dive straight into the content. But um, again, this this topic is is the same basically for all the specs. Like you need to know um, the the bases. Some of the actual examples are slightly different, but yeah, certainly all the core stuff is the same. So SNAZY G, we do a little bit on neurons at the end. Yeah, we talk about how they're how they're adapted. Um, when we're moving on to digestion, that will be, yeah, probably a fair amount later. So when we do our web classes, once the, the package is actually started, we do three or four classes a week. So we get through the content much more quickly. So rather than just one a week, obviously we progress, but we basically work through the syllabus in order. So we start with like cellular biology and then we move into um, other parts. So I'd expect the digestive system to come up within the first two or three months of when classes start. Um, so, what are subcellular structures uh, in animal and plant cells? So, organelles, basically, examples of organelles. Um, so, we'll have ones that go in animals and plants, and we'll have ones that are just plants only because there's some. Yeah. Nice, Alia. So plants only have chloroplasts. Um, yeah, ribosomes would be both. Nucleus would be both. Uh, what else we got? Cytoplasm, both. Uh, cell membrane, nice. Nice, nice. Vacuole, where should you put vacuole? Let's put that in plants only. Um, this is technically large permanent because you can actually get vacuoles in animal cells, but they are not large permanent vacuoles. So just to make that absolutely clear. Uh, cell wall, nice. That's another plant only one. Uh, oops, I wrote W first. So cell wall made of cellulose, this gives plant cells extra rigidity and structure. So it makes them nice and strong. Cool, I'm happy with that. Oh, that's maybe I'll just add mitochondria. Because they're a really important one for aerobic respiration. So don't wanna mess those ones off. There are a few more organelles and actually you learn about more if you carry on for A-level as well. But that's, I think that's all the ones we need to know for, for GCSE. If you know more, that's that's great, but um, they won't actually 
be required for GCSE. Okay, so what specialized cells do we already know? So how many, how many different cells can you guys name, basically? I'm sure we can get to at least four or five. Yes, muscle cell, nice. Never cell, presume that's meant to be nerve cell. What's another word for a nerve cell? Or we can put nerve, but you can also call these neurons, put nerve cell in brackets. Um, yeah, cells in the phloem and the xylem. Very good. Um, oh yeah, nice lots of you saying neuron now. Root hair cell, I like that one Mills, yeah. I'm just gonna put there like that, just to speed it up. Um, definitely, very good one. Yeah, Timothy, exactly. Basically any cell that you can name other than a stem cell is going to be a specialized cell. Um, so yeah, it's kind of just a, a, a thing of how many cells can you, can you name. Uh, Evan, nice, guard cell and uh, goblet cell, very good. So guard cell, which are the ones around the stomata that open and close, and the goblet cell are in the respiratory system and they secrete mucus, so some good ones. Yes, white blood cell, like that one. White blood cell and red blood cell, also called urethrocytes. Brackets, R, B, C. Um, nice. And yeah, palisade cell in the leaves. Very good. So there's loads of types of cell. Sperm cell, nice. Oh yeah, I meant to say that because someone put gametes and uh, yeah, probably better to be more specific. So yeah, sperm cell and egg cell are two more examples of cells. Let's put them down. Sperm plus egg. So yeah, loads of different types. Um, why do we have so many? That's, well, that's what we're gonna sort of explain later. So yeah, let's talk about how they become specialized. So the process of becoming specialized is known as differentiation. So they sort of differentiate, they, they grow different features or they uh, express different proteins and this leads to their different functionings. So as a multicellular organism develops, cells differentiate into other types of cells. Into um, And you've listed lots of those for me. So in animal cells, most of these differentiate pretty early on. So before you've even been born, most of your cells have already differentiated uh, and they're no longer stem cells. So this is why uh, certain tissues are not very good at like healing themselves or growing in, in adults. Um, so yeah, what we put this on. So uh, most differentiate early. Just going to put in utero, which basically means like while you're growing in the uterus, while you're a, like a developing uh, embryo or fetus. Um, yeah, nice. Whereas in plants, lots of these cells remain they they keep their ability to differentiate. So they remain unspecialized in the adult in the adult plant. In plants, many cells remain unspecialized, even in the adult plant. Yeah, nice. We call that tissue merist or meristematic tissue or meristematic cells, or the cells that can do it are grow in the meristem of the plants. Exactly, Evan. Uh, yeah, and some of you are mentioning adult versus um, 
uh, embryonic stem cells. So we do have some unspecialized cells in adults. We call them adult stem cells. However, they're not completely unspecialized. They can only differentiate into a few different types of cells. Like for example, we've got stem cells in our bone marrow uh, that can grow into different types of blood cells. They can become red blood cells or various different types of white blood cells, but they couldn't say become a neuron or they couldn't become a muscle cell. So they're already partially specialized in, um, in adults. Whereas in, em in embryos, an embryonic stem cell is what we call pluripotent. Um, it can differentiate into any cell in the, in the body. Or if we take it from um, even earlier on, uh, it could be totipotent, which will become any cell in the body plus the, uh, like the embryonic cells, tissues, like the ones that make up the umbilical cord and the placenta. Uh, yeah, so the plant cells remain unspecialized so they can develop into more tissues. So it's uh, just like a quirk, the way they've evolved, it's more useful to, to be like that. So um, yeah, and humans are, um, yeah, uh, well, and most mammals are not very good at regrowing lots of tissues because we don't have stem cells. Our cells have already specialized. So um, other animals, something like an amphibian, uh, they can regrow like whole sections of their, of their like body. Like if they lose an arm, they can regrow it. But we can't do that because we don't have the stem cells for it. Embryonic stem cells are pluripotent. Yeah, exactly. Um, difference between pluri and totipotent is whether they can become the placenta and the umbilical cord. But to be honest, that's not useful to us. We don't need them to be totipotent um, because we don't need to grow an umbilical cord or a placenta once we're born. So we're only really interested in pluripotent. That's all we need for medical uh, purposes. Um, it doesn't really help us to be able to grow those, those um, other tissues. Okay, I think someone asked what this was. This was in utero, which basically means like in the uterus, exactly. Uh, like when it's developing. So this baby is in utero right now in this picture. Okay, pluripotent just means they can grow into any body cell. So a pluripotent stem cell could become a muscle cell, could become a neuron, it could become a skin cell, could become a goblet cell, ciliated epithelial cell, it could become any of them if it's pluripotent. It's totally unspecialized. So it hasn't differentiated at all. Okay, so let's look. At, let's look, talk a little bit about like why or like how they actually differentiate. So this is our like undifferentiated um, stem cell. So we can call this one. This is like a um, pluripotent stem cell. Pluripotent, and these ones will be multipotent. So between here and here, they've become somewhat specialized, and they now can no longer form like all the different types in the, in the body. So the example I gave of the blood cell ones, they're, they're an example of a multipotent stem cell. So that's what we get adult ones. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Amira, Tim, exactly as Tim said, he answered your question underneath. So um, yeah, thanks for that, Tim. Um, nice. So they, they basically, specialized by developing different organelles. So they acquire these different subcellular structures, AKA organelles to carry out different functions. So cells have to carry out different roles. Therefore they're probably gonna need different tools to do that. And that's why they develop different organelles and different shapes and structures. Candy, you get stem cells both in fetuses and in adults, but the ones in fetuses uh, can become more different types of cells. So they're more useful from a medical standpoint. So um, yeah, you can do a lot more with an embryonic stem cell than an adult stem cell. However, what we're trying to do now in like medical 
like research and and like how we're trying to improve is if we can if we can take adult cells and turn them into stem cell um into stem cells that would be the most useful uh like thing we could do because then we've got an unlimited supply of stem cells which don't have any ethical concerns because we're not having to take them from um embryos and um yeah, the tissues would also, the DNA would match the host who you're giving it to. So it's like a win-win if we can do that. So that's what, like, there's a lot of different medical uh, teams working on that, trying to get to, to, to solve the problem. Whoever does it will make like billions and billions of dollars, pounds. Like it will be a huge breakthrough in medical, um, medical treatments. So um, quite a few questions. The yellow one would be a multipotent one that can develop into different types of muscle cells. So you don't need to know the names of any of these. Um, in fact, you don't even, I wasn't really gonna get into stem cells today. So I've kind of ended up talking about this more than I was um, planning on. Uh, we're not going over mitosis and meiosis today, unfortunately. Um, yeah, we're, we're, not, we're not covering that. <laughs> Another time. Uh, Okay, differentiation is important because it makes the organism more efficient. More efficient. Because the cells can be specialized for their, their role, it makes the organism more efficient. The, the blood cells are specialized to carry oxygen. Um, the muscle cells are specialized to be able to contract. It makes them work more efficiently. If they all had to do everything, if every cell was like a jack of all trades, none of them would be very good at anything. So you can't be good at everything. The more specialized you are, the more, uh, the more specialized you are for one particular function, the better you can perform that function. That's the idea. So this allows, allows multicellular organisms to be much more efficient than if they only had one type of cell. Um, cool. So let's just recap what cells, tissues, organs, and organ systems are. Has anybody got definitions for these that they wanna share? I'll, we'll write down some of the, the best ones. <clears throat> Um, just looking at your, some of your things, yeah, that cyclin dependent kinases is, is, is not even in A level, I don't think, let alone GCSE. So don't, don't worry about that for GCSE. Mm -hmm. So cell is the building blocks of all living organisms. Nice. Tissues, yeah, groups of similar cells working together to perform a function. To perform a job. Mm-hmm. Nice, Sarah. And oh, lots of you actually. So organs, uh, groups, tissues working together to perform a specific function. Uh, like different tissues. And then, nice, yeah. Organ systems, a group of particular organs working together with a particular role. Yeah, I like that one, Pooja, that's good. Nice. Um, um, into systems. 
to perform a different function. So in this example, we've got a epithelial cell, which is like one that lines the edge of a tissue. And then we've got lots of those. I would make up the wall of the small intestine. Um, so the tissue, the organ is the, um, well, actually it's kind of not very clear where it's from. It's from the small intestine rather than from the stomach. So that's just in there, but it's actually from the wall of the small intestine. And then the organ system would be the digestive system. So it's made up of the um, stomach, the small intestine, the pancreas, the colon, the esophagus, all those things would be in the uh, organ system. And then that's just one organ system in the whole organism. So they've also got their cardiovascular system, pumping blood around their body. They've got the respiratory system doing gas exchange and um, lots of things. So an epithelial cell is one that lines the edge of a tissue saying, so you've got them like in your respiratory system, like the alveoli, they've got epithelial cells in there uh, and also lining in the trachea. You've got them inside your digestive system on your skin. It basically demarcates the, the boundary of a tissue until the external environment. So it's like a, a skin or a, a layer to at the edge of a tissue. Okay, so how are you guys feeling with that so far? Everybody following? Nima, yes you do, yeah, they all get recorded. So if you miss one, you can, um, you can catch up afterwards. Exactly, that's where, the, that's where we get the word like epidermis from. From the, like it's the same, same root as epithelial. Cool, mostly ones, that's good. Tim, minus seven. I don't believe you, you've given me some very good answers. So uh, I'm not believing you're not following on. Okay, so let's do some exam questions then. The normal format is we do some teaching topics and then we do some actual exam questions to see how it would come up in an exam context. So the heart cells develop from stem cells by a process called cell differentiation. What is meant by cell differentiation? Just a one marker. Um, epidermal tissue is uh, the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so cells becoming specialized for different roles. Roles, functions, something like that. Yeah, nice. So it didn't have to be like word for word like that. What you guys are saying is all good answers. So yeah, Alia, you kind of given an explanation as well. So the way they do it is by expressing certain genes. Um, so that's good to add that detail. Make sure you're just getting the basics on there as well though, as well as the uh, like, sort of the explanation. Um, nice. So next one, multiple choice one. Well, no, well, I guess it is a multiple choice. Um, yeah, tick the correct box, essentially. So to be larger, organisms need to be multicellular. What is an advantage of being larger and multicellular? What do we think? Zane, I would add to perform a specific role as well. That would be better if you could add that. But for one mark, just saying cell specialization is probably enough for the answer. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So it's C. Yeah, it's weird that it hasn't got A, B, C, or D on there. But uh, yeah, essentially C or the third one down. They're able to differentiate and specialize. That's the advantage makes them more efficient, basically. Okay. 
So another uh, question now, three marker. We've just got to match up these uh, parts of the human body with their scientific name. So let's label these two, three, and let's label these A, B, C, and D. That'll make it easier to match them up. So layer of cells lining the stomach, the stomach, and then the mouth, stomach, intestines, liver, and pancreas. What are these things? One D, yes. What happened to One Direction? Are they just still split up? I wonder if they'll do a, a comeback tour at some point. What else we got? Two A, nice, yeah. So the stomach is an organ, very good. Then three. What are we saying? People saying C for three, an organ system. Yeah. So that would be the digestive system, basically. So mix up a organ system. Cool, nice. So um, let's now basically go through some specialized cells and talk about the different features that they have. So we've got a sperm cell here. How are they adapted for their function? Got three main points, one to do with the tail, one to do with the midsection, and one to do with the, the head. So can anybody, um, yeah, give me any things they could say about those three sections. Mm -hmm. So tail is for swimming or for mobility. What's the other word for tail? What's another word we can call it? Swimming or mobility. Oh, yeah, Zane, you got it there, flagellum, nice. Cool. And nice, Sarah, I actually wasn't even thinking about that one, but yeah, we'll add that as well. Acrosome has enzymes to digest the egg, or digest the wall of the egg. That's how they actually like burrow their way in and get in to fertilize the egg. Nice. Um, so this is also the nucleus. How's that different in a sperm cell than normal? Um, yeah, lots of these are good points, which I wasn't necessarily thinking of. Uh, definitely like small head, like streamlined shape for ease of swimming. That's a good one. Um, yeah. Meg, you've mentioned mitochondria. The mitochondria are actually here. So let's put those on um, in the midsection. So that's what the squiggles are meant to show. Lots of mitochondria to provide ATP for uh, movement. AKA like swimming. Yeah, the nucleus is haploid. That's probably the most significant thing. Um, uh, half a set of DNA, basically. So in humans, that would be 23 chromosomes. They need to do that because when Fertilization happens when the sperm and the egg meet. If they didn't have a half set of DNA, when they combine their DNA, you'd have twice as much. You'd have double the amount of DNA you needed. So you need to do meiosis first, which creates gametes, which are haploid, half the DNA. So when you have fertilization, it brings it back up to the normal number. So you, you end up with 23 pairs. So two gametes with 23 chromosomes meet, they fuse, that's fertilization. Uh, that creates a diploid cell with 46 chromosomes or 23 
pairs. Okay, nice. I think that's all we can need to say on a sperm cell. So that's very good. Let's move on to muscle cells. So um, what can we add on this one? So there's three different types of muscle cell. We don't necessarily need to go into that much detail on these, but we'll, we'll, lay, we'll name them and then any features of muscles that we can add. So yeah, if we can name these different types of muscle, I'll write some like some stuff on muscles. Oh, Kelly, what does ATP mean? ATP is the sort of universal unit of energy in cells and in all living things. So it's a, it's a molecule that's used to provide energy. So it gets turned from ATP into ADP, which we won't go into too much detail now. But uh, yeah, think of it as uh, like an energy providing molecule. Yes, lots of mitochondria. Again, these are very active cells. So they need a lot of ATP. Um, um, so they're, 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 they're formed into fibers. So we call that a myofibril. So they're like long, thin cells. Um, yeah, some, I've seen some of you guys talking about the sex chromosomes and, um, yeah, Timothy, you're correct. So the, this is the 23rd pair of chromosomes. They're called the sex chromosomes because they determine someone's gender. So if you get XX, two X chromosomes, you're a female. If you get XY, uh, you're a male. You can also get, um, like variations you can have xxy or you can have xyy these would be intersex so you would have traits of both male and female and it's actually surprisingly common well i was surprised um how common it is it's like it's like one or two percent of all um all people are intersex which um is probably higher than well than people imagine a myofibril is a um, string of like muscle cells all joined together that create a section of a muscle. So muscles are made up of lots of um, fibers and we call those fibers myofibrils, basically. How do muscle cells get energy? They have mitochondria, lots of mitochondria, which are used for aerobic respiration. They can also do anaerobic respiration as well. At least skeletal muscle cells can, which provide some extra energy. Uh, and they also have their own store of glycogen. So they've got, they've got mitochondria and glycogen, which they can break down into glucose. So that's, and then they get provided with oxygen via the circulatory system. So they've got everything they need to generate their own, um, their own ATP for, for energy. So they are like, yeah, they're the most active cells in the body. If, if you exercise a lot, that'll be where most of your energy goes. If you don't exercise very much, then something like the liver cells will probably be your most, your highest like energy, energy consumption. Cause they work hard at all times. Whereas muscle cells only work hard if you're exercising. Well, again, skeletal muscle that is. Your heart muscle is obviously always working. So yes, some of you have named these. This is skeletal. And this is smooth. And this is cardiac. So that's found in the heart, heart tissue. Smooth muscle is found in like the digestive system or in veins. Uh, they're, they're involved with like vasoconstriction and vasodilation. So you get it in the, in the um, uh, cardiovascular system. Veins slash arteries. So together, these are known as involuntary muscles. because we don't consciously control them. We don't have to think about contracting our heart and we don't have to think about pushing food through our digestive system. So it's involuntary, it's all controlled 
without our conscious input. Thank God, because it would be, I don't know, it'd be quite, uh, quite stressful to have to keep thinking about making sure your heart is beating the whole time. So it's good that that's automated. The skeletal muscle, this is also called voluntary muscle. So this will be the muscle that you're most familiar with. This is the muscles that we use for movement. So like pretty much any muscle you can name is probably a skeletal muscle. So your biceps, triceps, hamstrings, quadriceps, glutes, pecs, uh, traps, deltoids, can't think of any more muscles. They're all skeletal muscles. Um, and they're the ones that you can like train in the gym and get bigger. And they're the ones that make uh, result in you being like physically fit or unfit. Um, not that they're not the only thing, but that's one of the um, sort of features of uh, someone being fit and not fit. Okay, do muscles have both? Uh, yeah, good question actually. Um, skeletal muscle can respire both aerobically and anaerobically, but the involuntary ones, the smooth muscle and the cardiac muscle can only do aerobic respiration. And this is really important because if you do anaerobic respiration, it leads to muscle fatigue. Um, so the muscle gets tired because it's building up lactic acid, basically, which uh, prevents it from working if it builds up to such a level. So you know how if you try and do a sprint, eventually you have to stop. Your muscles uh, will cramp up because you're producing uh, lactic acid because you're respiring anaerobically. And eventually they, they, you can't run anymore. That's fine if it's your skeletal muscle, but if it was in your cardiac muscle, suddenly your heart would stop working. So that'd be a, that'd be a real like problem. So they only use uh, aerobic. Aerobic only for respiration. This one is anaerobic plus aerobic. Missed up an A in there. So they can do both. Yeah. So yeah, hopefully Tim's answered your question there. Um, so yeah, you actually don't get much energy from anaerobic respiration. You, you get 36 ATPs from one molecule of glucose if you do it aerobically, whereas you only get two if you do it anaerobically. So it doesn't actually provide very much, but it allows you to get extra energy that you wouldn't be able to do aerobically. So it's it's good for like short bursts of high energy. So if you need to catch prey or run away from a predator, um, yeah, it's it's good for that. But it's not sustainable and it's not efficient. So, and it builds up a nasty byproduct, which is lactic acid. Whereas if you do aerobic respiration, all you produce is CO2 and water. Water is obviously harmless. CO2 can be toxic if it builds up, but we're quite good at removing that from our body in a, like via our respiratory system and cardiovascular system. Okay, so I think that's enough on muscles. That's like another type of cell. So this is a ciliated cell. Um, where, where do you find these? Lactic acid like lowers the pH in the muscles. So it prevents them from working. It can like denature the enzymes. So um, yeah, that's why, that's why you feel that burning pain. It is actually an acid in your, in your muscles causing the pain. So yeah, different people got different lactate thresholds. The, some people can take a lot of lactate without and still be able to push through it. They tend to be good at endurance sports, whereas some people, their muscle cells cramp up more easily. Like if they had the same amount of lactate as, a, as an endurance athlete, their muscles would have stopped working before. You can kind of, but you can train it as well. Uh, yes, so ciliated ones you find in the trachea. Uh, lining of the trachea. You also find them in the fallopian tube where they waft the egg down the fallopian tube. But the ones in the trachea are the more famous ones. So there's also the, um, someone mentioned at the start, there's goblet cells, which look a little bit like this. They're also in the uh, lining of the trachea and they actually produce the mucus uh, that these cells waft. So the T cells work together to keep the respiratory system clean. You've got goblet cells producing mucus 
and you've got ciliated epithelial cells which waft the mucus up. So they're covered in these little hairs. And to be fair, I can see why you guys said, some of you said the digestive system, because these look, these look more like villi, microvilli than like cilia. So they're actually like really fine hairs, more like, yeah, more like hairs than fingers in their shapes. And they, they waft rhythmically and they waft the mucus and the trapped dirt and pathogens that the mucus collects out of the respiratory system. So it helps, basically helps keep our lungs clean and free from infection. So really important, those two cells, the Batman and Robin of the, the, uh, the respiratory system, helping to fight infection. Um, why is it called ciliated? Because it's got lots of cilia on it, exactly. Yeah, so these are called cilia. So something that's ciliated is containing cilia. They don't have them in the esophagus. Um, no, just in the respiratory system. So um, mucus traps dirt and pathogens. It's made by the goblet cell. Won't write that down there. Um, cilia. Ciliated cells waft this mucus the up and out of the respiratory system. So it helps keep it clean. So this is one of the things that's affected if you smoke. So if you smoke very infrequently and like yeah, not much smoking. After having a cigarette, you just paralyze the cilia. So they stop working for a, like a period of time, depends how much you smoke. Um, so it could be like 15 minutes, could be half an hour, but they will like, they just paralyze. They'll come, they'll come back and they'll work properly again. If you smoke more regularly, then they're not just paralyzed. They actually um, start to die off. So you end up not really having many cilia. And again, the more you smoke and the more regularly you do it, the more pronounced this problem is. So if you don't have the cilia, uh, the mucus is not able to be wafted up and out of the respiratory system. So um, yeah, you're gonna get the like mucus building up and you have to cough it up. So that's why it's called a smoker's cough. A lot of smokers have a quite a, like a phlegmy sounding cough. And that's because the cilia aren't working. They can't, they aren't doing their job. So you have to like manually cough it up. That's not as effective. So you've got an increased chance of getting respiratory infections, like a, like a pathogen growing in your lungs is much more likely if you're um, coughing. Uh, sorry, if you're, if you're smoking. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Let's look at uh, next cell now, we're going to look at a nerve cell. So firstly, let's label some of the features. Then we'll add sort of like an explanation on what's going on. Do you cough up dead cells? Yeah, there could be some cells in there. Um, the, the actual cells don't die. They stay there from smoking. Most of them they're not killed, but the cilia are killed, the little hairs on them. So the cells are still there, but the smoking like destroys the cilia basically. So they can't waft anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these are the dendrites. This is the cell body. Um, this one, does anyone put it? Uh, candy, yeah, they will regrow. Exactly. And I think there was some relatively positive study that said if you stop smoking, I think it's after like 15 years, you basically got effectively no increase. Like, it basically, your lungs are quite good at recovering. If you haven't smoked for like that many years and you stop, they can make a like pretty, 
pretty good recovery. Um, yes, this is the axon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, not not like encouraging smoking and then stopping, but just saying that it is like, there's basically, it's always good to stop. Doesn't matter if you smoked for a while, there's always a benefit to stopping. The lungs will recover to a certain extent. Um, so yeah, it's not too late, basically. Uh, yeah, this is the myelin sheath. So that's basically what insulates the axon. So the signals, they'll arrive from other neurons via a synapse. They pass through here, down the axon, and then at the end is an axon terminal. This will synapse to another neuron. So the, um, they're very long um, cells. Let's put some of this down. Long cells with Myelin sheath for insulation. Um, transmit impulses. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It increases the speed that the signal travels, basically. Is two axon or axon terminal? Two is the axon. Like the like this whole thing is the axon from here to here. And then this will be the axon terminal. Um, nice. And this is the nucleus because they still have nucleus and like cytoplasm and other organelles in the cell body. Um, okay. Nice, yeah, I'm happy, happy with that. Yeah, so transmit impulses, brackets, electrical signals. So because we use electrical signals to, to send uh, impulses, send messages around our body, we can like hijack that. So like, for example, if you tasered somebody, or if you watch a video of someone getting tasered, uh, you see that like their body starts to like spasm. So the electricity from the taser is sort of like, is causing nerves to fire, which causes muscle contraction. So it's basically uncontrollable muscle contractions. You can't like, you can't stop it because your nerves are being triggered by the electricity from the, from the taser. So um, yeah. And as long as the taser is firing, you basically can't control your muscles. They all, they all contract at the same time. Um, what are the messages? We're not going to go fully into it, but they're just like electrical impulses, essentially. So it's caused by changes in ions, uh, going ions basically passing across the membrane and we call that depolarization and polarization. Um, and that's what actually causes the, the change in voltage. And that's what causes the electrical signal to be generated. Um, Cool. Alia, yes, this is on YouTube. So you can, this will go on YouTube for forever. Well, well I can't but guarantee forever, but for, for a long time. Okay, let's look at plant cells. So two different types of specialized plant cell. We've got a palisade cell and we've got a root hair cell. So what can we say? Samuel, how big are the nerve cells? Actually, the nerve cells can be some of the longest cells in the body. So for example, um, in a giraffe's neck, there's actually, the ones that go through the whole way through the neck is one cell. So they're like some of the longest cells in, in existence. Um, so yeah, very long, thin cells. Yeah, so differences between a root hair cell and a palisade cell are no chloroplasts. No chloroplasts in a root hair cell because they're underground. No light. Uh, what they do have is a large surface area for absorbing water and minerals.
They actually also have a lot of mitochondria which aren't drawn on this diagram, but they need, they actually use active transport to bring the minerals in. So they need mitochondria for that. Um, Palisade, yeah, it's most defining feature is that it's packed full of chloroplasts. Packed full of chloroplasts for photosynthesis. This is because their location, if you looked at a leaf uh, cell, the palisade, uh, palisade cells are packed in at the top of a leaf like this. So the sunlight is hitting them first. So they get all the sunlight, they get all the majority of the sunlight, therefore that's where the majority of the photosynthesis happens. Um, oh, actually having said that you never get chloroplasts in root hair cells, it's not actually always true. Some, some plants do have uh, chloroplasts in their, in their roots. Um, like if you, if you, has anyone got an orchid in their house? If you look, if you look at a, an orchid, they're often grown in clear pots and that's because the roots are able to do photosynthesis. So they're quite unusual in that regard. It's because typically they don't grow underground. They grow in like other trees and stuff. So the roots can be more exposed. Um, Evan, yes, active transport and root hair cells, basically fairly straightforward. They get minerals, which are in the soil and they actively transport them across their membrane using energy. So they use ATP to pump in the minerals and that lowers the water potential. If you pump in a lot of minerals, so a lot of salt ions, it's gonna make it a more concentrated solution inside the root hair cell and therefore water will follow due to osmosis. So they actively pump in the minerals and the water passively follows. They don't actively pump water, they just pump the minerals. Um, and that's how that works. Um, cool. How much have we got to do? Let's do one more question and then, yeah, we'll probably call it a day there. So we're going to skip over these ones. Um, but that's two more examples of specialized cells. So also in the plants used for transporting, uh, well, let's just, oh, let's, let's just do it. So transports water. Dead cells that transport water, H2O. Um, they've got like, it forms a continuous tube. They've lost the actual parts that, um, that separate them. So they're a bit of an unusual one because it's most cells obviously are living. Um, please, oh, <laughs> please use Adam cells. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, they're, they're dead. Um, they've got no cell ends to create a continuous tube. Um, phloem cells living transport sugars. Um, have cell ends. Uh, perforated cell ends. So they've got holes in them, which allow the stuff to move through them. Called sieve plates. They're called sieve plates because like a sieve, they're, they've got lots of holes in, which allow the stuff to move through. H2O is water, yes, exactly. Um, yes, there's a lot of lignin in phloem cells. This is a strong material. It's basically what wood is made of, um, of lignin, and that makes the xylem very strong. Um, but it ultimately kills the cells. So they, they've got a lot of lignin in. The lignin actually ends up killing, killing the cell. What defines a living cell? Yes, a living cell would need to be doing metabolic processes. So um, yeah, there's no like working enzymes, there's no cytoplasm, there's no organelles in the, the xylem once they're like fully developed. So um, yeah, they don't do anything. They're just 
they're just like dead dead tissue mostly lignin and that's what makes up the bulk of wood so as it's kind of interesting as trees grow they grow outwards in layers each year that's why you get rings on trees so basically if you cut into a tree all the inner layers that's just lots of old xylems when that was on the original like that used to be the outside of the tree uh, and as the tree grows they um just stay stay there so basically wood and lignin is all just dead, dead xylem cells um yes this is unidirectional this just goes up This goes up and down, depending on the time of year and uh, the conditions. It goes from source to sink. Uh, lignin is just in the the uh, xylem cells. Yeah, uh, it is sieve spelt the other way. Yes, <laughs> um, I do that quite often. How come it's blocked? It's not an advantage that it's blocked, but it's because the cells are still living. So they haven't completely lost their end walls. So it's not actually really advantageous. It's actually harder to push stuff through, but it is because the cells are still alive. They're not quite as specialized, you could say, as the, the xylem ones. Um, well, they, I mean, I don't know if you could argue which one's more highly specialized. They're, they're, they've got different like different role and a slightly different way of doing it. Okay, yes, yeah, so we will end there. We basically got through everything. Uh, there's a couple more questions which we didn't get a chance to do, but um, yeah, that was, that, was, that was pretty much the whole lesson. So that was good, good timing. Um, so hopefully you can now do all these uh, objectives we were aiming to do. Um, I'm gonna stick around for a little bit if you've got any questions on anything to do with that. Otherwise, just some reminders. Um, we've got these classes for one more week and this week as well. So these are the different times. Make sure you set a reminder on YouTube, subscribe to the channel, and then you won't forget. Um, and the competition. So yeah, 10, something like 10 more days, nine more days. I forgot what the date is. To, um, yeah, to go over that. And cool. I think that is everything yeah so thanks thanks for joining um hope, hopefully that was helpful and yeah i'll stick around for another couple of minutes otherwise have a good evening and hopefully see you next week yes go eat a pancake i already have pancakes for breakfast but i'm gonna have them again i think for dinner uh sieve plates are just in the phloem yeah they're not in the xylem yeah they the island, there's no end walls at all. So no sieve plates. Cool. What is their function? It's just like where the cells used to have a wall that separated them. They've got holes in them, which allow substances to move through. That's how they, that's how they work. Um, cool. Right. Yeah. Any other, any other questions? What are we doing next lesson? I actually can't remember off the top of my head. We, there wasn't supposed to be another one, so um, I can't remember if it's even been decided, but I think it's something still on cells, so it's sort of something follows on from this. Yeah, Evan, exactly. That's called the cohesion tension theory, but we don't cover that in GCSE. That's just in A-level. Um, yeah. Giovanni, yes, well, I was a teacher in schools, but now I just do tutoring. Um, not like classroom teaching anymore. Snap provides accounts. We, we've got a A-level package that's been running for a few years and we're now just launching a new GCSE one. So there's gonna be both. They end in one more week. So one more week of these YouTube lessons and then um, and then we move on. Uh, yes, exactly. Ultimate revision. Exactly. That's how they, that's what they do. Is A-level biology hard? Yeah, it's quite hard, but um, all, all the science subjects are, are, are reasonably difficult, but it's, it also means that they're like re well respected as well, because it's known that they're quite hard. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, no, no worries. Um, we're not any more classes just because this was like sort of a promotion a thing to give you guys a taster of what our new package is about. So hopefully we're trying to get you guys to, to sign up really. Uh, and well, trying to show you guys what we do and what, what we're about. And then hopefully you are persuaded or convinced to, to give it a go. Yeah, everyone always argues which is the hardest. Um, and yeah, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. But if you're more drawn towards mathsy things, then maybe physics will be will be more of your like more suited to your like abilities. Um, but actually, all all three sciences got a lot more maths heavy when the the government did a like a reform a few years ago. Um. Anyway, yeah, I think we'll. We'll end there. So yeah, thanks. Thanks again for joining. Hopefully see you next week and hopefully see you uh, on our website at some point, some point soon. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.